So welcome everyone to Access You TV. Today I have the amazing Marilyn Bradford with me and we are going to be talking about um, how depression and addiction are related and how Right Recovery for You can contribute to changing all of that. So welcome Marilyn. Marilyn. Thank you, Thank you for having me. I'm delighted to be here. I'm so excited. Um, Marilyn is the author of Right Recovery for You, and she is an, also an access consciousness facilitator, as am I. Oh, for those of you that are new to my channel, I'm Michelle Edhouse. How does it get better than that? <laughs> so, Marilyn, just tell us a little bit about you and how you became um, involved in working with uh, addicts and recovery and all of that kind of stuff? Well, it's a great topic, depression and addiction, because I had both of them, <laughs> or at least I had them as defined by this society. Um, starting pretty much when I was a child. And uh, the addiction, which I was told I had to alcohol, that wasn't diagnosed until quite a bit later. Like I was, uh, I think it was in my thirties, something like that. Anyway, uh, I did some traditional treatments, which is to say that there was a time when I was on antidepressants and there was a time when I was going to um, 12 step meetings and all of this and that. And that was before I got to access consciousness because even before access, I had become a therapist for about 15 years specializing in addiction. Although I saw people with depression, I saw people with all kinds of things. Um, and I was beginning to question sort of the modern medical view of things. Um, right before we started this, I ran off something from the Mayo Clinic, which is the big deal uh, medical clinic in America, like you go to the Mayo Clinic. Uh, and it was interesting when they were talking about depression, they were talking about brain chemistry and genetics and all of this. And to me, that is not the cause. That is simply something that gets created as a result of what actually creates both addiction and depression. And I've been a therapist for 27 years. I don't think I've ever treated anyone with an addiction that also didn't have depression. So they come together because they have in many ways the same root cause. Now, I'm gonna go into that a little bit more, but I wanna say one thing first, which is that um, even though I had quote an addiction to alcohol, when I began doing the work with Right Recovery for You using the access tools, talking with Gary Douglas, the founder of Access, I realized two things. The first thing I realized was that addiction was really about a, a place where we go to disappear. It's where we default by making something greater than ourselves. Um, so it's way beyond alcohol and drugs. It can be to being right. It can be to being wrong. It can be to trauma drama. You probably know someone. Anytime anything happens, they're like, oh, you know. Um, so <laughs> it can be to being per the perfect mom. Yeah. It can be to um, making a lot of money. There's recently uh, an Olympic, I think she was a bicycle rider, young woman in her 20s who had been very successful, committed suicide. Um, and we've had a couple of suicides of celebrity type young people in America who were quote successful because the success has nothing to do with what, what's going to work for addiction or depression. Um, so having said all that, let me go back to what I've, oh, the second thing I wanted to say about addiction is that I discovered that what we think of as the regular addictions like alcohol and drugs and gambling and relationships are actually secondary addictions. Underneath almost every single one, and the exceptions are, I think, a few people who've gotten addicted to certain kinds of pain medications without having gotten there through other means. There are a few people, particularly, and I'm not sure why that's so, 
but it doesn't matter. But that there is a primary addiction, and that is to judgment and the wrongness of self. And this is what actually also underlies depression. You know, you go to a medical doctor and they're talking about your brain chemistry and this and that. Well, when I uh, first got my degree, I worked in a psychiatric hospital and I was very fortunate that it was very progressive and there were a lot of psychiatrists who actually were interested in more than just giving pills who worked there. And I got involved. It was the time when multiple personality disorder, this was in the early 90s, was uh, sort of the thing. And so I got to study with a group of psychiatrists. And one of the things that came out of it was that actually trauma and our thoughts even can change the brain chemistry. So which comes first, the brain chicken or the eggs? And I would say <laughs> it's your thoughts that actually affect the brain chemistry. And you can reverse the brain chemistry by reversing, well, I'm using thoughts. It's that's not really an access word, but that's okay. Um, they are thoughts. You know, when we go, I'm good, I'm bad, I did that wrong. Um, you can actually begin to reverse depression by reversing that. So let me back up. What happens to people who have depression and who go into addiction? So what I have found is that, and this does not necessarily mean that parents are wrong or bad. It truly doesn't. But if a being, a being is born into the world, if that being's essence, their energy, who they be, and we're not born as blank slates, we're really not. If that being doesn't fit well with that family or that culture, they begin to get messages and it can be done with love from the family. You know, it doesn't, sometimes people are just mean and yeah, that happens too. But you know, I'm sorry, Susie or Johnny, um, you really can't study art. You know, we're farmers or you really can't study farming. We're artists. Um, so what you get is a bad fit. And particularly if that child is active and curious and happy and you're in any kind of family where the parents desire and the schools particularly oh don't get me started on schools the schools want people to kids to shut up be quiet sit in rows line up and you have someone who's like well, i don't like this and how does this work and i want to know this you know those children begin to get the message that they are not okay yeah their questions are not okay their desires are not okay who they be is not okay and this, I think, is the most damaging thing that we can do to any child and any person um, that they're not okay, who, that, where they are, who they are. It doesn't mean you don't, you know, if they're hitting someone, it doesn't mean you don't go, you know, Sally, you need to stop hitting Johnny. This is not actually going to create what you desire. Um, but you ask them questions and, and we're not going to get into parenting. And I know you're a great parent, Michelle. So I'm assuming you have some other programs all parenting. But um, so this begins to create within the person just this incredible sense of wrongness. And you can't walk around the world believing that you're wrong in your core being. And it's not I did something wrong, it's I am something wrong. And that's the difference. You know, as a parent, you can say, you know, that behavior is not okay, but you don't ever say you're a bad, bad person because you did that behavior. But that's what a lot of kids hear. And once again, it's not always from the family. It can be from all kinds of influences, social influences, socioeconomic, race, all kinds of things. Um, I did a course, a teleseries recently with two other wonderful beings. And uh, uh, we called Recovering from Mother, which was, and it's not about making mothers wrong, you know, but we talked to one, we had people from all over the world, which was really fun, but one of the women, we had a long interview with the woman who was translating for China, and she was talking about how, you know, the, the mother has to have the child do everything perfectly like this. And if the, and a child is bad if they ever question. So a lot of the stuff is cultural and passed down. 
Um, and it's easier to see sometimes in other cultures than our own. But you get a being that is just at their core believes they're wrong. So why would you not be depressed and anxious? Sad, I'm nobody, I'm no good no matter what I do. Anxiety, I know I'm gonna screw up again. I know I'm gonna to get told, you know, I'm not right. So generally the depression precedes the addiction Although my sense is I was addicted to candy, sugar, very early on. I, I, had, I, I wanted it so much. It was like I had to have it to feel okay. I made it greater than me. I made it the source of my okayness. Yeah. Um, to the extent that my family put um, five cents, which in those days was more, but a five cents um, a day allotment that it was all I could spend on candy because that's all I wanted. But so you have this being who is just at the core, it's so painful to be them that they're looking for somewhere to lose themselves. Yeah. And that's when they go into drugs or alcohol or being the star athlete or getting straight A's. You know, a lot of addictions are things that we, oh, well, she's, that's wonderful. She's top of a valedictorian, but she can't stop studying. And if she gets less than an A, even an A minus, it's a catastrophe because that's what she's given to her power. So anyway, it's a bit long winded, but <laughs> I hope that answers the, at least begins to answer the question. I would love to hear what questions you have, Michelle. Yeah, absolutely. And the, the thing that really got me there was, um, and as I've been reading the book again, I've, I've read it several times now, but I've been reading it again and just looking at all those places where I personally um, go to get away from that, that thought of I'm wrong and all the places that I've been looking at what can I be or do to try and make me right um yeah. and you know I, I mean i came out of the womb sucking my thumb and eight years my mother struggled to no 11 years my mother struggled to try and get me to stop sucking my thumb um and it was lollies that she replaced it with <laughs> stop sucking your thumb for a month and <laughs> all the money to spend on lollies um so just that replacement of one thing with another. And, you know, um, with, with depression, we, we try and replace the sadness and the depression with happiness mm -hmm. uh, without having them both as being choice. Yes, absolutely. Beautifully said, yeah. We talk to um, how right recovery invites people to have their addictive compulsive things as a choice rather than completely eliminating it can you talk a little bit oh about sure that? you brought up so many ways i could go but let's go with that one first um one of the questions i ask clients always and usually the first time i see them or in class that you know within the first morning if i'm doing a right recovery class on addiction, and I ask, what's right about your addiction you're not getting? And they're like, what, it's bad, it's terrible, wrong. Everybody's judged them, everybody's told them how they have to quit, everybody's told them they're bad, everybody's told them they're wrong, they're a loser. And I, I remember uh, one of the first women I asked this, and she's like, it's terrible, it's the devil. She was very Christian, which is fine. Um, I'm like, so, Okay, so what's right about it you're not getting? Well, what do you mean? Well, what does it do for you? And we started going through things. It was, she had, she was drinking between one and two bottles of wine a day. And she said, it's the only time my family leaves me alone. They had adopted some foster children. There were a lot of problems. She said, um, it helps me not deal with the fact that my marriage is falling apart because I don't know what to do. It, she had been very abused as a child physically and sexually and psychologically. And she said, when those monsters come up, this is the only thing that will calm me. I don't trust people. I only trust the alcohol. So I said, look, and, and we came up with like eight things that it was doing for her. That was what was right about it. And I said, here's the thing. 
if it's doing that much for you right now, how can you possibly stop, because you'd come to me to stop, before we look at some ways of changing those things? What if you just allow yourself to have your wine, you know, obviously don't drive, but have it with awareness. Okay, what am I using it for today? Not in, I shouldn't have to use it, but maybe a better phrase. What is this doing for me? What is this helping me with right now? So a lot of what I tried to do in the beginning is to take the judgment. Because remember, the primary addiction is to judgment and the wrongness of self. Well, judgment is anywhere you're judging what you're doing or what's going on. Um, I loved what you said earlier when you said, you know, I feel so wrong and then I try to make myself right. So what I try to write to judgment too, is I work to help people get out of judgment and just be present with what is. I remember I had a client once and she, um, she said, I'm, I'm going to Mex for Mexican food and I'm really scared I'm gonna drink because I can't imagine having Mexican food without a margarita. She'd been, quote, sober. She came to me sober for a month or two, I can't remember. I said, look, why, why don't you go, why don't you have a margarita? order a margarita and drink it with awareness. Take a sip, go, hmm, how is this? How do I feel? What's it doing for me? Do I want another sip? So she came back the next week and she was like, I said, what happened? She said, I discovered I don't really like margaritas. <laughs> Brilliant. No. She said, when I had no point of view about it, I realized that, you know, they're, they're kind of, I don't really like tequila, you know, all of this. So it's actually what keeps, a lot of what keeps people in addiction is judging themselves for being wrong for doing it, mm -hmm. if that makes any sense. Uh, and I was, um, I've, I've worked out a way I can get my phone to read Kindle books to me. So I was listening to oh, Recovery as I was driving the other day, and I had a packet of Tim Tams, which is a type of chocolate biscuit. And, um, and no, like my norm for driving is I have food and I, I, I drive like this. And as you were talking on the book, you got to talking about this exact part and I was like, oh, okay, let's, let's play with this. I'm going to, so I'm deliberately going to eat the cookie from awareness and I really got myself very present with the biscuit and just ate small amounts rolled it around my palate really tasted it really enjoyed it yeah I got to the end of it and carried on driving and about 20 minutes later I realized I hadn't reached for another biscuit because oh, I'd yeah. actually been completely present with that one yeah. really tasted it got the enjoyment and I didn't require another one because I'd, I'd experienced it it was right, <laughs> right. beautiful but, Michelle that's exactly it depression and addiction are both about not being present yeah. I mean, you're really sad. You can't be present. You're engulfed in your sadness and in your wrongness or in your anxiety. And when you're with addiction, when you have your shot of alcohol or chocolate and you want another one, you want another one, you want another one, um, it, it, you can't be present. And that's a real key to choice is that willingness to be present. And also a couple of other things I want to say here. One is not referencing the past. If you go to, oh, I always join the guys on, at the bar on Friday night, so I have to go do that. Or I can never stop at one. Or whatever it is for you. If I don't make an A, I'll die. Or if, if my child um, gets a bad mark at school, I, I'll, I'll crumble. I can't be me. You know, that kind of thing. Whatever it is for you, if you don't reference the past, but instead stay present, like you're talking about, just ask, all right, now what would I like to choose? The, Gary uh, Douglas recommends a movie called 50 First Dates, which I love because the young woman uh, gets, I can't remember what the accident is, but she gets amnesia. And uh, she doesn't remember anyone or anything the next day. And I often say to my clients, what if you woke up with amnesia? 
Would your addiction exist? Would your depression exist? Or are they the sort of culmination of all of these past events and choices that you've decided you no longer have control over and they're just a pattern and you're just the effect of them? What if you weren't the effect of them? Try some experiments, you know, try being present. Try um, having walnuts instead of wine. Try, you know, just another thing I say to my clients all the time is do one thing different every day. Because if you're doing something different, even if it's driving a different route to work or eating at a different restaurant or ordering something different or doing a different workout or wearing a dress you'd never wear, when you do something different, making a phone call you wouldn't normally make, contacting someone, when you do something different, you actually have to be present. Because all of a sudden you're going, oh, wait a minute, wait, I, I don't know where to turn here, or I, I, help, I don't know what to order, or, um, you know, it's three o'clock and I'm not, I'm not calling the boss, or I'm not putting in my product, or, so you have to be present when you do something different. And so much of life for so many people is lived on automatic pilot. Yeah. So that's another way to help you be present. Um, so, I know I may be, yes, go ahead, please. So with the, um, with the depression side of things, um, that constantly looking for where you're wrong and how you're wrong, um, just takes you, you, you're always looking at what you've just done, which uh -huh. is the past, which and is the past, whether or not that's wrong, or mm -hmm. looking to what you're looking to do in the mm -hmm. future, and whether or not that's right or wrong, and you're never actually being present in that moment, are you? No, exactly true. Exactly true. And one of the things that I tell people if depression is more of the issue, I say, get a cat or a dog and act like them. <laughs> don't. I mean, seriously. <laughs> you just have to decide if you're a cat lover, a dog lover, or both. They're not, you know, that cat can fall off the shelf and in two minutes he's like, oh, that was, a, that, that was on purpose. You know, when they're licking themselves or, you know, the, the dogs are generally mostly happy. Nature doesn't have this judgment. And if you are depressed, I really encourage people, instead of nitpicking at all your little problems that you've decided or you have or you are, get out in nature and just be. Walk in nature, sit by a lake, do whatever works for you. Um, go to the beach. If you're in Australia, New Zealand, where you have all these beaches and beautiful mountains. Um, but get yourself out of the human culture of judgment and of living in the past or the future because you may not even know what the any energy is of being present if you walk around nature you, and you're aware and you just stop you look at the bee buzzing by or the birds flying over they're not going you know oh my gosh yesterday my black wing didn't look that good you know and i'm afraid that if i fly north it's going to be wrong i should have been flying south so that's one thing that I always recommend while helping see people see how they judge themselves from pretty much like the time they came out of the womb and what that's creating and that that's not real. It's one thing I often tell people, feelings seem real, but they often don't reflect reality. Wow. That makes sense. Yeah. That one again, Marilyn. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, feelings seem real, but they often don't reflect reality. So if someone says, I felt like they were so mean to me, I'm like, let's look what was said. Were they actually mean to you, or is that just your interpretation? Here's another one like that. All judgments are arbitrary. All judgments are arbitrary. So feelings can feel real, but they often don't reflect reality and all judgments are, are arbitrary. They're just somebody's point of view. Yeah. You know, someone will think a dress is beautiful, another person thinks it's ugly. Someone will think an action was kind, another one will think it's intrusive. 
It's just a point of view. It has no basis in reality and what's true. Wow. That one's huge. Yeah, both of those, I think. <laughs> I still have to remind myself of those sometimes. And it's interesting, like, you know, in Access, we talk about your point of view creates your reality. Right. And you talk about this in the book as well. And basically what you've just said is those, those two points that you just made are based on that. But they just open up a totally different space, for me anyway, to actually really look at, you know, what is real? Yeah. So how that much which you make real is real, generally. <laughs> <laughs> so how much of what we live our lives as just every day is actually real and how much of it is created by, mm -hmm. as you say, all those thoughts, feelings and emotions from the past. Mm -hmm. And the belief systems were given, whether it's a religion or a cultural thing, or, you know, the, the Maxwell's always do this, or, you know, we, all of those things create what we decide is real and true. And if you look at it, that's a lot of what wars are. They're just two different points of view that don't work well together. No, I'm right. No, I'm right. No, I'm right. It's the basis of any argument. It's the basis of any argument. Exactly. So the more people can move into being present, which is aware, just being aware of what is, not judging it. Not, I was wrong. Now, how do I be right? But, ah, what am I choosing? What's going on? Yeah. What actions could I take here? What's possible here? If you can really get to that space and have allowance for yourself and others, which again, allowance is not a doormat. It doesn't mean that you walk, you let people walk all over you, but they, it's okay if they have a different point of view. It's okay if they live in a house that you would never live in, you know. Absolutely. So if you, Hmm. Oh, that's such a big question and too, far too many variables. Sorry, I won't ask that one. <laughs> <laughs> so from a, um, what's one tool that people could take away from this, watching this and um, start to unravel that wrongness of the self. Mm -hmm. uh, here's, here's a good one for that. And, and if you really have been in the wrongness for a while, it may take a while for you to keep get for you to be getting really all of the benefits, but I encourage you to start right away. And that is, if I weren't judging myself, what would I be aware of right now? If I didn't decide I was wrong in what I said to Joe or Mary, what would I be aware of? Oh, I said what was true for me. I said what made me happy, you know? Oh, interesting. They're making me wrong because they've decided that that's a way to control me. Oh, okay. I don't think I'll be controlled, but that's interesting. You know, it's just... If you were not making yourself wrong in this instant, what would you be aware of? What was actually going on? And that's one I still use all the time. I really do. And I would say, and we talked about this earlier, do, some, do one thing at least different every day and get out with nature or with animals and ask yourself, if I were being like a cat or a dog or a bird right now, what would I be doing? Yeah. You know, we think that we're the dominant species because we're able to destroy a lot of things. But actually, you know, they don't live these lives of judgment, which to me is much more advanced. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, Marilyn, um, I know that your book is available on Kindle and the Access Consciousness website, and there'll be links to those in the description below. Um, but how else can people get hold of you? 
Uh, I'm happy for people to email me at MarilynBradford at me.com. That's M-A-R-I-L-Y-N B-R-A-D-F-O-R-D at M-E dot com. Uh, right Recovery Review has a, it's a YouTube channel that has a lot of videos. Um, I do work with people on an individual basis. And I'm coming to New Zealand. Yay! To do some Yay! I'm so excited about that. <laughs> I think I'm we're coming to New Zealand. It's so, so cool. Yeah. So, so, and you and I do, do classes, too, you know, teleclasses too sometimes. Yeah. So you do in-person classes and you do teleclasses um, and those are all posted on your right recovery for you dot com. Right. right now, there's not a lot posted, but that's going to that's going to be changing as I nail down some dates with people. Awesome. Um, and. If you were to have one more thing to say to everyone about addiction and um, depression, what would you say? Um, don't give up. Don't give up. Find the gift and beauty of you. As seriously. There's joy there. There really is. And if you can get out of the sort of robo suit you were put into, of who you were supposed to be and how you were supposed to act and what you were supposed to do with your life, just go, nah. you know, no, I'm me. And begin to find out what's true for you, regardless of what anybody else thinks. You know, I used, I don't know if this is appropriate, but I'm going to say it anyway. I used to tell people that judgments, people are judging you. Judgments are just like farts. It's their stink. It has nothing to do with you. It's just like, you know, Thanks for judging me. Thanks for farting. <laughs> <laughs> really... I love it. Awesome. So they're about the same. I put them on the same level. Yeah. Factually, yeah. it's better one than the other, but you know. Very cool. Very cool. So thank you, Marilyn, so much for coming and joining us today. I have totally enjoyed your company. So super looking forward to you coming to New Zealand end of August, beginning of September. And uh, what else is possible, guys? What can you choose in your life? And as Marilyn said, what is it that you can do different today that will create more ease, more joy, and more glory in your life, living, and reality? I adore you all. Thank you so much, Marilyn. And how Thank much you. Have. All right. Bye-bye. Talk soon. Bye.